This is Software Engineering Radio, the podcast for professional developers on the web at se-radio.net. SE Radio is brought to you by the IEEE Computer Society and by IEEE Software Magazine. Online at computer.org slash software. Welcome to Software Engineering Radio. I'm your host, Gavin Henry, and today my guests are Carl Wiegers and Kansas Hokanson. Carl Wiegers is Principal Consultant with Process Impact, a software consulting and training company in Portland, Oregon. He has a PhD in organic chemistry. Carl is also the author of 14 books on software development and other topics. His most recent book is Software Requirements Essentials, Core Practices for Successful Business Analysis, and Kansas is a co-author. Kansas Hokanson is a business architect and PMI Agile certified practitioner at Argon Digital, a software development, professional services, and training company based in Austin, Texas. With over 10 years of experience in product ownership and business analysis, her latest book is Software Requirement Essentials, Core Practices and Successful Business Analysis. Carl and Candice, welcome to Software Engineering Radio. Today we're going to talk about software requirement essentials, and as luck would have it, you've both written a book on that topic. So I'd like to start with a brief review of what requirements in business analysis mean and spend up to 10 minutes on five different parts of requirements engineering. Um, Actually, is requirements engineering the correct term? Well, I think it's a slightly optimistic term, but it's the term that I use. The term that's used more often in recent years for, for this domain is business analysis, which encompasses things beyond just requirements, but requirements engineering is where my heart's at. Excellent. So what do we mean when we use the word requirements? Who would like to take that question? Well, I'll start with that, Gavin. And I think this is a great place to start today because people interpret the word requirements in various ways. So I always have to begin my training classes with some definitions. So at least for the the time we're together during the class, we're all talking about the same kinds of things. So I think of requirements as encompassing two major perspectives. First, there's a description of stakeholder needs and constraints. And second, there's a description of the capabilities and characteristics of some solution that we're trying to build that we expect will satisfy those needs. But people sometimes talk about requirements as if they're all one big monolithic kind of thing. I think it's better to put some adjectives in front of the word requirements to distinguish these various sorts of requirements related information. We talk about business requirements, user requirements, which are sometimes generalized to stakeholder requirements, but I don't like that term very much because as far as I can tell, all requirements come from some stakeholder. There are solution requirements, which are typically subdivided into functional and non-functional requirements. Non-functional requirements include things like quality attributes and constraints. We have data requirements. You might talk about features, use cases. There's all sorts of things that people talk about in this domain. So I think it's valuable to, to differentiate those with some adjectives. And these various kinds of information come from multiple sources at different stages in the life cycle of your project, and they're represented in a variety of ways. Thanks. Well, um try to break them down in the next sections. I think this one is for Candice. What is business analysis, Candice? Oh, that's a big question. Because as Carl mentioned, business analysis is a, a rather large umbrella. But in my opinion, at the at the highest level, business analysis is really everything that it takes to understand a projects or products or even a company's business problems and business objectives. And from there, define a solution that would solve that problem or achieve those objectives. From there, then business analysis decomposes that solution into the set of requirements knowledge, like Carl mentioned, that can be built, tested, and deployed to meet those business objectives and solve those business problems. So obviously, that includes a lot of activities and artifacts, and the software requirements is one piece, but a very critical piece of that. Thanks. And in your book, it discusses 20 requirements practices. So we're not going to be able to cover them all here, but I've picked a good chunk of them and broken them up to five sections where we can hopefully spend about 10, 15 minutes on each. So the first one I have here is requirements elicitation. I said that correct? Yes. Who would like to explain what that means without looking up? (laughs) Well, that's another good place for a definition. The first thing we have to do regarding requirements is to get some. 
And people often talk about gathering requirements, but that's a little restrictive. The term requirements elicitation is broader and more accurate. I mean, of course, there's an aspect of gathering or collecting requirements out of people's brains and documents and existing products and all other sources. But elicitation goes beyond that because there's also a lot of discovery and invention that takes place during requirements elicitation. So you can't just ask people what their requirements are and expect to get a useful or very complete answer. The business analyst is really a guide or the requirements engineer, if we're being optimistic. They're a guide that leads this requirements exploration. And people also need to understand that elicitation, like the rest of the stuff that we're talking about in this general broad category of requirements development, that's an incremental and iterative process. You can't simply ask people what they want in some workshop, write it down, and then come back with a good solution sometime later. It would be great if it were that simple, but it's not. So we need this business analyst to guide the process and try to ask the right sorts of questions, explore the right kinds of information to get the knowledge that we need to build a good solution. And this business analyst is a person that you just mentioned. Well, yeah, although I keep getting asked questions about, well, is AI going to take our jobs and how is AI going to affect business analysis? And that's actually something that I haven't paid much attention to. There are other people doing that. But for now, yeah, it's people. And has this evolved, the software methodology has transitioned from waterfall to agile or, you know, for example, because you mentioned it was an iterative constant elicitation. Well, it is. And uh, even if you're doing, I mean, I get really tired of hearing people talk about waterfall versus agile as if those are the only two possibilities. And of course, they're not. Those are two extremes of a spectrum. And one thing you'll learn as you get older is that either terminal position of a spectrum is almost always silly. And being somewhere in the middle is almost always more reasonable. But, but certainly, we don't want to we let people think that you can just do this once at the beginning of a project, go away and come back later with the right answer. But nor can we just have a couple conversations as we go along and then come back for a couple more conversations and expect to get a, a broad picture of what we're building and see all the pieces fit together. So yeah, it's an ongoing process. And partly it's ongoing because you get some questions answered, you go away and you think about it and you realize there's more questions or I didn't fully understand the answer. So I think of requirements development as progressive refinement of details. You know, you get a certain amount of information initially, and then you have to elaborate that at the right time in the right level of detail with the right participants. And so I think the concepts apply, whether you're talking about a waterfall or, or agile approach or anything in between, it's just a matter of how much you do it and, and who's involved and what you do with the information you get. And the gathering the requirements is as I understand it, from both sides. So the user has a problem or the business has a problem. You'll try and document that or whatever it is, but then more requirements will pop up from your side. So it's it's driven from both sides, isn't it? The elicitation. Yeah, Candace has got a lot of experience with those kinds of agile projects. Do you want to talk about that, Candace? Yeah, it's just a fair, as Carl mentioned, it's kind of how you do it and when you do it. You're doing the elicitation maybe in smaller chunks as you're preparing for an iteration versus maybe a whole release, but you're still having to do the same fundamental activities of getting that information out of people who may have an idea of what they want, but we still have to figure out if that's really what they need, if that's going to solve their problem, and then getting that into a format that can actually be consumed by the developers. So you still have that iterative and ongoing conversation with your users, with the developers, just in in at least in most Agile projects I've worked on, kind of smaller chunks. That leads us on to my next question perfectly, which is, do users always know what solution they need? And by the sounds of it, no. <laughs> yeah, you know, anytime I see a word like always or never, the answer is almost certainly, well, not always. There's there's going to be a an edge case. But in this case, I would almost go so far as to say a lot of the time, users don't really know the solution that they need. They may have an idea or a vision, of what they think will meet their needs, but then it takes a strong and skilled business analyst to work with their users and understand the full problem space to say, yep, that's really going to be a correct solution to meet your problem. Or yeah, that looks shiny or sounds good, but it's not really going to do what you think it will do. And so as 
Carl talked a little bit about, you know, eliciting and getting information out of people. One of the ways we like to do this is by asking about usage. Like, what are the things you need to do today to get your job done? And then we can help translate that into what it might look like in the future. Yeah, because I've always wondered, could companies bring a product onto the market for the first time? Take, for example, Apple or someone. It's brand new. It's been invented. Where are the requirements coming from there? must be some problem space they're trying to address or... You know, if it's brand new in the market, is it just better than what was there before? Or it's a strange one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and consumer products definitely are more likely trying to exploit opportunities, and they see a, a niche maybe where some, maybe even unspoken, or like we didn't know we needed iPhones or smartphones until they existed. That was and exactly now, my <laughs> my thought pattern there. And now we can't live without them. And so in that case, it was probably a a case of. Apple just being smart and saying, hey, people have cell phones today. We can make them better. There's an opportunity. We could be the first to market. And because they were, I mean, it really took off. Candace touched on a really important point there that I want to emphasize, Gavin. She mentioned usage. And that's one of my hot button issues when it comes to requirements is that you can take two approaches to exploring requirements. One is to to focus on the product, you know, ask people what features do you want? The other is to focus on usage, ask people what they need to do with it, as Candace brought up. And I think that is an absolutely essential point. And I think that would be applicable certainly to not just business situations where we can talk about how people do their job now and how that might be different, but you can do that with new product development where we think not in terms of the features that somebody might say, oh, that's cool, or you put it in because someone figured out how to do it and perhaps someone will find it useful. Sure, some of that's fine, but let's think about what people want to do with a device. And as Candace mentioned, they may not even know they want to do that, but let's try to imagine how that might work. Think about what people would do if they had this product available. And I believe that in almost every case, a focus on usage is more likely to yield accurate and valuable understanding of requirements than as a focus on products and their features. Yeah, that was one of my next questions about the, the users always know what they want to do with it versus what the solution is they need. So thanks for that. What information do we need first? I think there's a nice chapter in your book called Laying the Foundation, which I've kind of skipped over. But obviously we need to do that. Can you take us through that? Yeah, I can comment on that. We do have six sections of practices. These 20 practices are grouped into six categories. Five of them address the major subdivisions of requirements engineering, that is, elicitation, analysis, specification, validation, and management, which I think we'll get to today. But we also have this this chapter called Laying the Foundation because we describe five practices that I think are fundamental to putting into place the basics up front about what we need to do to understand how to proceed with the rest of the project. So the first practice really addresses this question of let's make sure we all understand the problem before we converge on any particular solution. Next, let's define our business objectives so the participants all understand why we're even undertaking this project. It's important also to define the solution's boundaries, which helps the team take scoping decisions. What's in? What's out? You can't do everything, so let's draw those lines. So all of that will then help you identify and characterize the various stakeholders who need to contribute to the requirements process. And little safety tip, there are almost certainly a lot more stakeholders than you think there are initially. So that that's worth thinking about. And finally, from those stakeholders, we can then identify the empowered decision makers who are going to have to handle the various types of many requirements related decisions they're going to encounter. And, and let's figure out who those people are and how they're going to make decisions, preferably before they encounter their first major decision. Yeah, I think we touched upon some of this when we last spoke so just for the listeners that haven't heard that show episode 518 when we spoke on more general software engineering lessons based on your 50 years experience at that time excellent so we're going to dig into the five terms you mentioned requirement solicitation is what we're almost finished analysis requirement specification validation and management Before we move on to the next section, I'd like to pick an example that we can pull apart as we move forward. Would 
either of you be able to give me an example project we could talk about for requirements analysis, our next section? Sure. So this is a project I worked on several years ago. We were completely rebuilding one of our clients' credit adjudication platform. So how they get information from customers, go to credit bureaus, determine if someone is credit worthy, and then give them a decision. So we had set the scope of doing kind of a major replatform of their credit adjudication process to make it more flexible going forward. And to do that, we had to make major database schema changes. And so we can talk about this through the various areas today as well, but in terms of elicitation and kind of understanding the problems, one big hurdle we ran into close to launch was we had to make these these large database schema changes to support our project. And probably a couple of weeks before our go live date, our main stakeholder came and said, no, we couldn't change the database schema. If we had just taken her at face value, this would have completely derailed our project and sent us back to square one in terms of defining what to do. So instead of just saying, yep, let's start over again, I worked with her, did some elicitation to understand why she was so resistant to changing the database schema. Well, as it turned out, she had several kind of SQL queries that she had written based on the database that were driving all of her regulatory reporting. So once we knew this, instead of going back to square one, we actually offered to rewrite all of the SQL queries so that her reporting would work with the new database structure so we could launch on time. And thus, we saved that that project, at least at that point, and we were able to move forward. So we can continue to talk about that one as we go. Excellent. And I guess it it does come down to how flexible they are on that yes or no, doesn't it? If she said no, I'm not I'm not going any further into detail, then there's not a lot you can do, is there? There's two points. Well, there's a lot of good stuff in what Candace just said, but there are two points I want to reinforce. One is the nature of constraints. And we talk a lot about requirements, but we also get constraints from our various stakeholders that we have to understand and and document and communicate to all the other participants because those limit some of the choices that we can make, either in terms of what requirements we can do or what the designers and developers can do. And in this case, saying, no, you can't touch the database, that's a pretty major constraint. In this case, it could have been a showstopper constraint, but we need to know about those things. And the second point I want to make is that Candace mentioned that she asked why. And that's a wonderful question to ask, especially if you hear something that kind of surprises you or sounds like it's maybe going to limit what we need to do. Let's understand why. Because you know, people like to say, well, the customer is always right, so we have to do what they want. And that's just silly. We all know the customer is not always right, but the customer always has a point. So we have to understand and respect that point and then figure out what to do moving forward. And you mentioned blockers or showstoppers there, uh, constraints. The two usual ones are time and money, aren't they, with, with regards to business? Yeah, those are project-level constraints, and then there can be requirements-level of constraints. There are lots of kinds of constraints. We should probably put some adjectives in front of those, too. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to move us on to requirements analysis. Who would like to explain what that is? Well, I can take a shot at that. Uh, you know, in a way, I, I used to think requirements analysis just sounds like something that just somehow happens if you stare at the requirements long enough. But in reality, there are some specific things we can do around requirements to fully understand the, the requirements that we have. That's all really what analysis is about. So requirements analysis involves first ensuring that the needs of all the stakeholders are understood and documented appropriately. And the outcome of this, a successful analysis, gives us confidence that we can build a satisfactory solution to meet those needs. We can define it, we can agree upon it, we can build it, and we can test it. So there are a lot of things to look for when you're analyzing requirements. For example, we need to understand each requirement's origin and rationale. That gets back to why again. So why is this in there? And there can be a lot of reasons, and some of them are good. Some maybe mean, oh, I guess we don't need to do that. A big part of analysis involves decomposing requirements into appropriate levels of detail and then deriving requirements from other information, such as business rules or policies. Those aren't requirements, but they can certainly turn into a lot of requirements. I mean, just think about security. You can have a very concise security requirement, but that turns into a whole lot of functionality. 
We need to make sure that any exceptions that could take place are identified, they're handled. We need to define acceptance criteria and so forth. So there's a lot to think about besides just writing down each requirement as clearly as you can. Analysis goes down to another level. And you talk about once the analysis is ongoing or complete, a term requirement sets. Could you take us through that? Yeah, there's a list of requirements. And a a business analyst can find many potential problems by looking at individual requirements in isolation. I've kind of done that as a consultant over the years. I've reviewed a whole lot of requirements documents for clients, and I can find a lot of problems just by looking at a specific requirement. You can find ambiguities and and things like that 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 let you know that maybe there's a need for more work on it. But requirements don't exist in isolation. They exist in the context of lots of other requirements. So that's what I mean by a set of requirements. And when you're analyzing sets of related requirements, you have to look for some different things. You need to look for omissions. Is there a requirement missing from this set of related things, or is there a piece of information missing from certain requirements? Look for conflicts and inconsistencies. You can have a parent requirement that conflicts with its children, or you can have one requirement that says do A and the other one says do B, but you can't logically do both. Look for duplications. That's a whole conversation in itself. There are dependencies one requirement might have on another. And please keep in mind, when we're talking about this general term requirement here, I don't really care what kind of information you're using on your project. You might be using user stories as your atom of requirements. But that user story could have dependencies on others as well. So if you don't like the word requirement for your project, then substitute you know whatever term globally, this is your local terminology. Priorities are relative. You, you can look at one requirement and say, well, that's you know high priority or X priority, but that's relative statement compared to what? Compared to the others in the set and so forth. Missing requirements, incidentally, are perhaps the hardest kind of errors to find because they're not there. They're invisible, so they're kind of hard to see. So these are some of the things you look for if you're trying to analyze a set of related requirements. And Candice, when you spoke about the database schema and the user or the business needing it for compliance reasons, there'd be quite a few parts and pieces of data that would need to be set together or kept together. So that would sort of feed back to this, wouldn't it? Once you said, we'll rewrite these queries, but we need to keep X, Y, and Z together. Absolutely, yeah. In terms of the requirement set, we had the, the features that described the changes to the database schema. And so we relied heavily on that when we were analyzing the SQL queries to rewrite them. And um, what are requirement models? Oh, one of my favorite things. So requirement models are just really any way to visually represent requirements information. A lot of people, when we talk about requirements, use natural language text, but a lot of times that's not the best way to represent information. So these could be tables, pictures, wireframes, or even models we're familiar with from, say, a a UML type modeling language like process flows or data flow diagrams. But they can be really helpful in finding requirements and identifying those gaps in your requirements that Carl had mentioned in terms of things you were looking for in that requirement set. I've also found it's a really great tool for elicitation as well. It's an interesting psychological aspect of humanity that it, we're much quicker to correct something if, when we're shown something than to be able to make something out of nothing. So if we have those requirements models that show a view of the world, then our stakeholders can tell us if they are correct or not. And how would you create those models? Just sketch pad and paper or, you know? It really depends on what you are trying, what information you are trying to show visually. So I'm a big fan. We use Lucidchart here at Argon Digital for our more formal models, for wireframes, certainly just a, a sketch pad. Back in the days when we got to be in person, I love just moving sticky sticky notes on a whiteboard. Yeah, it's surprisingly effective, isn't it? <laughs> yep, because it's very, you can move them around. If it's wrong, it's not set in stone. And then you can take a picture of it and kind of more formalize it later. And so it's just really powerful to get that information out of people as well as to do that analysis. And one of the things I recently found out, I guess a couple of years ago, is that not everybody thinks the same way. I mean, it sounds obvious, <laughs> but until you actually think about it, you grow up thinking everybody thinks like you. And this was true for myself as well. I realized a couple of years ago that I have aphantasia, 
which is the inability to see pictures in my head. I just kind of assumed nobody could see pictures in their head, but I was wrong. And so for me, learning that and kind of helped turn the light bulb of why I love visual models so much because I can see it in person, so to speak, right on the screen or in paper or on the whiteboard versus trying to visualize it in my head. Interesting. Thank you. I'm a big fan of modeling as well. I took a a course in structured analysis and design many years ago, 1986, I think, and that just totally transformed how I thought about software development. Tremendously powerful tools. There are lots of kinds of pictures we can draw, standard diagrams from these various modeling languages like UML or structured analysis or IDEF0, and there's a lot of them. And one thing I always recommend to people is please do not invent your own modeling notation because these are communication tools. It's a language. And we all have to be able to speak and read the same language if we're going to communicate effectively. If you draw some kind of picture and nobody knows what an arrow with two double-head arrows means, then it's going to be a problem. So there's lots of standard kinds of models. We should learn about them. This should be a standard practice for every business analyst. And I suggest that they use the standard models in almost every case because I think it will be quite rare that they want to depict some information and nobody has yet figured out a picture to draw for that. And um, with regards to this section of requirements analysis, can you give me an example when this step is not needed or is it something that is always needed? So I believe that no matter what project or product you're working on, some level of requirements analysis is necessary. Now, the level how much analysis you do and whether you're using specific visual models or whether you're creating prototypes versus I've done this a thousand times, so I'm able to do the analysis ad hoc in my head, that could definitely vary. But I think you are still doing some level of analysis for every single requirement that we are writing. Now, some cases where you might use less analysis might be if the product or product team are well-established and they have you know consistent delivery velocity. So maybe then you're using less time on analysis, but you're still doing some. On the other hand, if you're doing new or risky or unknown projects or unknown features, you're going to spend a lot more time on analysis to really understand that problem space. And in those situations, they might call for a prototype because it's brand new. Absolutely. Especially if you're building something that that doesn't exist, prototypes are a great way to kind of get that, that early and iterative feedback by putting something in front of users that they can either imagine themselves interacting with or in some cases actually interact with. So absolutely, prototypes should at least be considered on all of the projects. This point as well, because that would also give you uh, more requirements, questions to ask the the users or the business once you try to build a thing. Exactly. For your example, Candice, did you need to do a prototype or is it more because this one was more API, it was more backend, it was because it was all automated, we didn't have as many prototypes, but we did have a simple UI where the users would view information and be able to reprocess different adjudications. And so for that case, we did have a very kind of simple wireframe prototype that we used in our early analysis. Yeah, because a prototype is something that you can throw away. Sometimes. Sometimes it grows into the product. You just have to make sure you understand up front, what are we going to do with this prototype? Are we going to use it to gain knowledge and then throw it away and build the real thing? Or are we going to use it as a starting point, which will evolve into the product? The strategy that you take with those two scenarios is very different because if it's the latter where you expect it to become the product, you better build it with production quality code from day one instead of getting into a situation where someone says, wow, this looks great. I think you're done. Can we have this? And the intent was not to do that. And then you have a problem. When would that decision be made? Whether you, When you start that prototype, whether it's going to be throw away or... Well, I would do that at that point because I think of a prototype as being an experiment. You're taking a tentative step into the solution space saying, if we understand the requirements correctly, then here's a way we might approach building it. Or maybe you know that you don't understand the requirements thoroughly, and so you build the prototype to help you explore those further and plug gaps in your knowledge. So view it as an experiment and understand what your objective is. You know, how will you determine if the prototype has served its purpose? And that thought process should let you decide, okay, what do we do with it when we're done? Excellent. So I'm going to move us on to 
our third section, requirement specification. Now, the word specification for me, I think of like RFCs, request for comments, or some big hideous massive thing that tells you how to do <laughs> exactly everything. Is that what we mean? Well, you could, and in certain situations, you need that kind of information because if you're going to be mailing your requirements off to some offshore development company to uh, build it, they're going to have fewer opportunities perhaps for day-to-day quick responses to questions and clarifications and, and elaborations, and they need more, more details. It really boils down, like so many things here, to a question of risk. And I think when people look at these books that talk about requirements, it can be a little overwhelming. Uh, Ten years ago, I wrote the third edition of my book, Software Requirements, which was co-authored with Joy Beatty, and that turned out to be a rather large book. It's about 645 pages long. But that doesn't mean you have to do all that stuff. What you need to do is say, here's a bunch of tools and techniques and practices And we will use whichever of those in whatever level of detail and timing is necessary to manage the risk on our project. And the risk we're concerned about is either building the wrong solution entirely or having to do a lot of rework to then fix whatever solution you have or whatever partial solution. I hate rework. I hate unplanned rework doing over something that we've already done. So I think people need to keep in mind the question of how far wrong could we go with this if we don't do analysis or if we don't write down our requirements in some structured way to communicate to other people. So I think requirement specification is really important, but we should remember it has two meanings. First, it refers to the process of recording what you learn about requirements in some persistent and shareable form. And then the second sense is the term, which is what I think you were thinking of, Gavin, is whatever container you store that requirements knowledge in. It could be big, it could be small. Different problems require different approaches. And it doesn't have to be a document. It could be a a document or a spreadsheet or a database or a, a commercial requirements management tool or a bunch of sticky notes on the wall, whatever works for your team. But we've got different kinds of information that we need to record. And I think it's important to do that simply to ensure effective communication, both among the various stakeholders and across time. Human memories are imperfect and incomplete. They fade and distort over time, and strangely, other people cannot yet access them. So I think of a requirement specification in some form serving as a persistent group memory for this critical requirements knowledge. Yeah, it's an agreed way to document and communicate. Right. Just a note for the listeners, Carl mentioned a book that he did 10 years ago. We also did a show 15 years ago very early one, episode 114 with Christoph Ebert on requirements engineering. So once you finish this, it would be good to listen uh, to that one after and see how far we've come along. Okay, so I think we've covered off my next question, which is how formal is this specification, which is kind of because of my misunderstanding of the term. Yeah, that's worth elaborating on just a second, if I could, Gavin, is it, you know, how formal it is. And the answer is the same as, unfortunately, with so many questions around software is, well, it depends. (laughs) It should be (laughs) exactly as comprehensive and formal as it needs to be to manage those risks of having to do a bunch of rework because we got it wrong. It's easy to go wrong in either direction of formality and comprehensiveness, You can try to pin down every requirement in detail up front, you know, in the classic, although I think rarely practiced in reality, waterfall approach. Or you can rely on telepathy, clairvoyance, and memories instead of writing anything down. And both of those approaches are likely doomed to fail. So let's use some of the the things that kind of Candace was getting at, you know, how complex the problem is, how long it goes on, and, and that sort of thing to try to determine, well, how much effort should we put into recording this versus just saying, okay, I think I know what you mean. I'll call you when I'm done. So we've answered the question, how formal is this? It depends. And also what the specification looks like. This isn't an RFC format. This is just what works for the project. And also what you touched upon there, Carl, um, about how detailed the specification needs to be potentially goes back to what you said before with the limits of time and money. You know, you don't want to spend the whole project trying to document the project. 
So, Candice, with your example project, what was your agreed way to document and communicate, you know, under the term specification? So I actually had worked with this client for a lot of their projects to set up how they would kind of structure their requirements and requirement specification. So we were using a modified, safe, or scaled agile approach. So we organized our requirements into epics and features down to the user stories that the developers would implement in, in their iterations. And then we would group those together into the releases. And we were using a requirements management tool at that time to organize everything. And so that was a really great way because it had a, it was a centralized repository. Everybody could access it. It had a really robust version history. So we could tell if someone tried to change our requirements, which happened from time to time. However, one of the things we did find is that like most requirements tools or even some specifications, they tend to be point in time. So this was the user story when we developed it, but that requirements management tool won't tell you. We built that in Sprint 1, but that was changed by another story in Sprint 3 or a bug that happened later. So I've been a really big fan, actually from my civil and structural engineering days, something called an as-built. So it's a kind of some lightweight documentation that says at the end of the release, what do we actually deploy? What is the product as built in, in use versus the myriad of stories that we built to support that release? So you used a tool, a requirements gathering tool. Just for the listeners, is that a commercial thing, open source thing, or a Google Doc? There are many, many requirements management tools. In fact, Argon Digital has done, I think, two tool studies of I think up to a hundred different requirements management tools that exist in the marketplace. Oh, if you've got some links, I'll put them in the show notes. Ah, uh, yeah, I can dig those up. Some of them are commercially available. Some of them are open source, and some of them cost a lot of money. <laughs> in this case, we were using uh, Microsoft's Azure product, their requirements management tool. But there are many others: Jira, Rally. I can't even rattle off all of the different tools that exist out there. <laughs> Thank you. And I guess from what you're saying, Carl, where the agreed upon way to communicate and document the specification isn't applicable to only large teams or large companies. No, not at all. I don't know if you've ever had an experience like this, but I worked on a project once many years ago. There were just three of us on the project. I was leading it and I was doing the requirements, which were fairly informal. We didn't have uh, anything as structured as what Candace was describing. This was in the oh, geez, mid-1980s, before I really appreciated how important this was. And we would have a weekly meeting, and then we'd go off and and work on what we agreed to work on for the week, and we'd come back and uh, reconvene to, to continue. And on two occasions, we walked away, the three of us, from a meeting with different understandings of what we had decided to do. And so we worked in different directions for that next week. And that that didn't really work out very well. So even having rudimentary recording of the knowledge and the decisions that are made, I think is really important because people's memories simply are not as reliable as everyone likes to think they are. Have you ever had a conversation where some decision was made or agreement was reached and people walked away and you found out later that they had different understandings of those decisions or agreements? Yeah, I was just trying to think of whether a tool like GitHub issues would be suitable to do this. But when you do an issue or a, this is what we're trying to do, it often doesn't capture the why, which is, which is what I think you're saying is why did we get to that point or how did we? And then if all three of you are, have a different memory of why that decision was made. Or even what the decision was. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that's happened a lot because it goes back to the initial or the, the ongoing, sorry, requirements capturing of, yeah, we've got to do this, but but why? And, you know, why did you think we did it that way? And when was that agreed to change it? Right. So having some records like that, I think, is very valuable. It doesn't have to be, again, any more detailed than necessary. But I like this phrase, a persistent group memory which can then be a resource that everybody can go to. Is it going to be complete and perfect and current all the time? No, probably not. And it takes some effort, but it probably takes less effort to build and maintain that repository of knowledge, decisions, and and agreements and details than it does to build something, found out you did it wrong, and then build it again. Well, let's just move on to the next section because I think it feels 
fits nicely. So requirements validation is the next section. How do you validate what what you're doing, basically? Is that is that correct? What does that mean, Candice? Well, I can maybe talk a little bit about what validation means, and then I'd I'd love to hear how Candice's team did that on their project. Uh, you know, just because you've accumulated some set of requirements in in any form, whether it's telepathy or whether it's detailed in a a tool, that doesn't necessarily mean you've got the right requirements. Uh, You could have a set of beautifully written and modeled requirements that seem crystal clear, complete, and unambiguous, and yet they could still be wrong, wrong in the sense that they do not completely satisfy the need that we're trying to do with our solution. So we need to validate requirements to make sure that the specified solution would satisfy the real business needs and hopefully achieve the intended outcomes that the stakeholders are looking for. I think it's a lot cheaper to do that before you finish building the product and then ask the users if you got it right. So we want to look for techniques that can give us that validating information that we're on the right track all along the way. And can you give me an example of that validation? Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, when we're validating the requirements, a, a lot of what, at least my goal, is to get as many eyes on the requirements as possible, to have different people with different lenses look at the requirements and, and compare them to other requirements information, whether that be prototypes or visual models or even a solution architecture, to, to find issues, to say, will this actually meet our business objectives and solve our business problems? And so reviewing requirements can be as simple as just reading them and saying, hey, do you have the same understanding as I do, to as formal as an inspection with checklists of specific things to look for. But I love getting multiple people to to review my requirements. In the case of my project, we were constantly reviewing requirements as because we were we were sprinting in an agile-ish fashion. So we were reviewing requirements with my the developers and testers, or as Carl likes to call them, the victims of our requirements. So I was weekly reviewing my requirements with them. I was also reviewing with our solution architects to un- ensure that what we were defining would actually meet our intended goal. Because we did understand what the business problems were up front, which is a really you know foundational piece to understand. Because if you don't understand what problem you're solving, how do you know if your requirements will meet that problem or solve that problem. And then, of course, with my business stakeholder as well, reviewing both the high-level requirements to make sure that the problem was solved, and then also some of the lower-level requirements of the details of how we would get to that final state. So that was one way we validated them. In this case, I didn't yet know about testing the requirements. That was one of my eye-openers as I was co-authoring with Carl was how we can use our multiple views of requirements information, like visual models and text-based requirements, to test the requirements before you've written any code at all. So we didn't do that on this project, but it's a valuable tool that I will and now currently do use on my current projects. And it's really about having two different thought processes, so either requirements and testing, and then two different brains, if it can be, and comparing them to find issues in both, issues in requirements and issues in tests. Can you test your requirements or are met oh, yeah. with software? <laughs> Absolutely. And people, I think, are surprised to think about that. But that was another real eye-opener for me. You know, as we go through our careers, you have a, a handful of, of small experiences and you realize there's a really powerful message in there. And the very first time that I did that, that message came through. I had written some requirements for a project, and it was just, you know, a couple dozen requirements. It was a simple thing. But then I said, well, I wonder how I could tell if these requirements had been correctly implemented. And so I wrote down a bunch of tests to go along with those. So as Candace said, really, there are two different thought processes. One is describing, go build this. And the other is describing, how do we tell if we built the right thing correctly, which is really both validation and verification. So then I took this set of requirements and a set of tests and I mapped them against each other. And I made sure that every test could be executed by firing off a certain set of requirements. And I made sure that every requirement was covered by one or more tests. And every single time I did that in my career, I found errors. I found maybe a place where there was some test that couldn't be executed. Well, what does that mean? It means either I'm missing or have some incorrect requirements, 
that would let that test happen, or it means the test is invalid. And I don't know which is which, but the fact that we created multiple views, multiple representations of that knowledge, a set of written requirements and a set of written tests, and even better, you could have a prototype, you could have some models like Candace talked about. In other words, multiple representations of the knowledge then give you the opportunity to compare them this way. You can take a diagram and some tests and trace through it with a highlighter pen, and you can find errors that way when you hit a test and your picture doesn't let you do it. Okay, something's wrong. And here's an important point. If you only create one representation of requirements, and it doesn't matter what that is, whether it's just stories or just acceptance criteria or just pictures, if you create only one representation, you must believe it. It's all you have. But if you create more than one, particularly if different people create them, then you can compare them. You can find these disconnects and errors and incorrect or different assumptions people made. So I think that's an enormously powerful way to improve the quality of re requirements early on. And if you're doing that in conjunction with the people who have the needs, that helps you validate that those requirements you end up with will meet their needs. And is there something that this validation, you mentioned validation and verification, are they the same thing? Well, they aren't really the same thing, although the terms are frequently confused. Uh, a team can make, for, make sure that their code passes its unit integration and system tests. They can confirm that the code correctly implements the design. They can confirm that the design addresses all of the requirements. Those are all software verification activities, but they still don't tell you if the requirements are the right solution requirements or not. That's what validation's about. So the, the, kind of the colloquial way people say that is that verification checks to see that you did something right. Validation checks to see that you did the right thing. When you get to the very top level of requirements, then basically they're the same thing because you're validating against what someone told you or what you found in various documents, you know, whatever the source of the requirements is. That's how you validate. You have to go back to the source. And that's essentially verifying that you've done that translation correctly as well. But, but basically, validation and verification are complementary. They are not the same. So if you've got your requirement, that could be feature X. You've done that feature. You've written the most applicable tests for it, unit tests, property-based tests, integration tests, what have you. Does that not mean because your tests are passing and the feature has been implemented that you validate the requirements and it's, sorry, you've verified and that now it's valid? Or is this a step completely regardless to what the features you've developed? If I ask that correctly. <laughs> Ideally, you'd be validating that they are the right features to build before you build them. So the way I think of it is that we should be validating before we build and then we verify after we build to say, did we build it correctly? So some of the colloquialisms that we like to use is, did we build the right thing or did we build the thing correctly? And so building the right thing is validation. Building it correctly is verification. And I actually sometimes when I teach my training classes, go back to a story, again, from my civil structural engineering days, you know, when a bridge fails, it's all over the news. And, and one of the first questions is, well, was it built to the specification? So verification, or was it designed wrong by the engineer? And that designing wrong is more of that validation of like, did we actually confirm that it would withstand the loads that we needed it to withstand versus did I lay the rebar on that bridge at eight inch intervals as per the specification uh, or, you know, use the right thickness of bolts or whatever. Okay. I think I understand that right. I was more trying to pull apart what Carl was saying where we've got this software-based suite that validates and verifies our requirements. And is that the same as the test we already write for software? Or is this something new? I'm not sure what you mean, software-based suite of tests. Like your, t your test suite where you've implemented a feature or you're testing a small unit of code, they, mm -hmm. if you scoop them all up because they've been driven by a requirement to create this thing, does that not mean the requirement is then satisfied? Or no, you... not well, it means the requirement is satisfied, but it doesn't tell you if it was the right requirement. 
It doesn't mean the customer is satisfied or the business need is satisfied. And so it's that gap that's, there. That that's the gap, testing. right? Yeah. That's exactly the difference between validation and and verification. And I think Candace explained it nicely. But yes, you can you can run all those tests. You can say, well, wait a minute, I satisfied the specification, so I don't know what you're complaining about. It's like. Well, because you're missing a whole chunk of stuff we need, or you misinterpreted what I said, or or things have changed. You know, that's the difference between validation and verification. Thank you. So I'm going to take us on to the last part of our show, which is requirements management. So who would like to explain this? I'll start. Candace has got a lot of uh, experience that she can fill in some details, but uh, so you know, so far we've been talking primarily about requirements development activities. You know, these four domains of elicitation, analysis, specification, and validation. And most of our practices are in those categories. And the the large volume of any book on requirements or business analysis covers those kinds of activities. But requirements management is the subdomain of requirements engineering that deals with how the requirements are used on the project and how the project responds to evolving needs. Um, There are several valuable requirements management practices. They include things like version control of requirements as they change over time because we want to keep track of those changes. Sometimes you have to revert to an earlier version, and it's good to know why a requirement was changed. We want to track requirement status, as each one of them, again, a requirement being whatever granularity you're at, user stories are fine. But we want to track status as they move from being proposed through whatever steps in their life cycle exist until ultimately it's either delivered and verified in the product or perhaps deleted from the the base or deferred to a future release. Requirements traceability or tracing, that's another important practice. And you know, if we had written a book about the 21 most important business analysis practices, I think traceability would have been the one we'd added. But we left that out. I think most teams probably don't do much tracing other than perhaps from requirements to tests. And again, that's a risk-based thing. I talked to uh, a guy once, it was the very first course I taught on requirements, and I've taught about 250 of them now, but the very first one I taught around 1995, there was a guy in the class who had worked on the Boeing 777 airplane project, and he said their requirement specification for the software was a stack of paper six feet thick, and they had a complete requirements traceability matrix. And for an airplane, that's a pretty good idea, but most people aren't going to do something that rigorous for you know, a phone app or something. But the two requirements management practices that we talk about in the book and that do apply to every project are establishing and managing requirements baselines, and then, of course, managing changes to requirements effectively. So those are, I think, core parts of requirements management that apply to everyone. And what's a requirements baseline? Sure, I can take that one. So the requirements baseline is really any set of scope that has been agreed by the stakeholders, development, and testing to be developed, tested, and deployed as a group. And once they have that alignment, this kicks off the change control process, this, you know, managing the changes after it has been aligned. There's a couple of different types of baselines that we talk about. So they can be time-bound, where you start with a time box, like an increment, a set of increments, or a release. And then you know when you're going to deploy. So you fill up that time box up to your development and testing capacity, and that becomes your baseline. Alternatively, we also have scope bound baselines. So we don't know the deployment date yet because we haven't necessarily sized everything, but we take a logical group set of functionality and we agree that it can be developed, tested, and deployed together. Regardless of which type of baseline you're using, it's really used to align all the parties that we can start and move forward with development with minimal risk of major changes. I mean, change always happens, but we don't want to get halfway through and find out we've built completely the wrong thing. So getting that baseline says, yep, we acknowledge there will be changes, but we are confident enough that we can build this and that the the changes will be relatively minor. And that does, of course, officially start the change control process for that set of scope. So really a baseline is simply an agreement, you know, what we're going to build in a particular chunk of time or chunk of work. And that's a pretty good idea to have explicit, even if it has some opportunities for changing. Is there an example you have from your project, Candice, where you said we agreed to get X, Y, Z done, but 
the user or customer came back and said, nah, we need this done and you got to deal with it. So we, we definitely had changes on our project. We had a kind of a multi-tiered approach to our baselines since we were doing a modified scaled agile approach. In scaled agile, they have program increments. So they all the teams that are working on similar products form an agile release train and they agree to a release schedule, which is typically four to six iterations. That's a program increment. And during that program increment, they'll have a planning session where they establish the baseline for that program increment or release. And so we would establish baselines at that level, which was, again, typically four to six iterations, so roughly a quarter, and then as well at the iteration level. So every every sprint or iteration during sprint planning, we would also have the baseline of this is what is in scope for this sprint versus the other sprints. And having that multi-tiered baseline meant that I, as the product owner, could move things between iterations as long as I kept them in the same release baseline. Now, of course, you mentioned if the stakeholder comes back and says, no, we need you know, something else. Well, that's part of that change control process. So we would be able to take those in, assess the change, and depending on our capacity, could say, yes, we can either do that or we can, but what are the trade-offs? What do we take out of the release or the iteration so that we can bring in the new story that you're asking for? And that process doesn't have to be super onerous. Um, it can be, you know, fairly lightweight, involving you know emails and discussions. But every team should know how they request changes and how those changes get incorporated into their products, so that so that they're all aligned effectively, right? Uh, one of the things Carl likes to talk about is that requirements is a communications um, problem or communications project, so to speak. It's not really a technical issue. It's really, can we get everybody aligned on what we should be building and track that over time? How do you manage these changes that they ask for? Just in the agreed requirement specification that we've discussed about, or is there a different way? So we had kind of a very lightweight change control process that we had agreed upon where as changes were identified, they would get sent usually via email, sometimes through like a communications IM tool like Slack. And then we would put those in our requirements management tool. So any requirement, whether it was part of the initial specification or part of the chain change control process, would get entered into our requirements management tool so that we had one place to track everything. From there, we would assess kind of the impact of that change. So how big it was, we would size it with the team and the development and testing team. And from there, we've kind of talked about the urgency. So is it something that needed to be in the current release or could it wait for a future release? If it was for the future release, it just got put in the backlog. If it needed to be part of that current release, then we would talk about trade-offs. Do we need to remove something from this release to make room for this? If the trade-offs were acceptable, then we would move the impacted scope out, bring the new change in, and it would be moved through the development cycle in the requirements management tool. So this was pretty lightweight. We didn't have a whole lot of approvals, but we did have, you know, a couple of checkpoints to say we have to do all of our requirements development work with changes just like normal requirements. So we have to elicit, analyze, um, specify, and validate them. So we did we did all of that and to under you know ensure that we had the right requirements documented as part of the change. And then once we knew the impacts, then we had another kind of checkpoint to say is this higher priority than what we're working on now so that we can make the appropriate trade-offs and you know keep the release moving. So in that way, we were able to take in most changes and just have that open communication. So there's a few toggles you can, switches you can tweak depending on what the, the user's after and see if it messes up your baseline. Excellent. So I guess it sounds like the requirements tools are separate from your project tools. It, this isn't the same as traditional project man- management at all, is it? Well, I always kind of uh, wonder what's, what people are thinking about when they talk about traditional anything. It somehow sounds pejorative, like anything traditional is old-fashioned and therefore useless or bad. You know, sometimes people will think, oh, we're agile around here. We don't do traditional project management or traditional fill-in-the-blank but it's much more important to consider whether a certain practice is likely to increase the project's chance of success, regardless of whether that practice is brand new or whether it's been used for decades. So for example, all projects define requirements baselines, 
as Candace described it, whether they call them that or not. It's just an agreement about what we're going to implement in a certain period of time or a certain release. People do that, although they may not think in terms of a baseline. And then if you say, well, you know, here you ought to have baselines, they think, oh, well, that, that's old fashioned. You know, we don't do baselines. Yeah, you are. You're just not calling them that. You may be calling it an iteration plan or something. What I had in my head was traditional being a Gantt chart that you move stuff around on. And, and you know, that's you still do that. I mean, people are still doing tasks on any project. They're still doing them in a certain sequence. They're estimating how long those tasks are going to take. They're looking at dependencies between tasks that have to be done in a certain order. You know, this has to be finished before I can finish that. A Gantt chart's a convenient way to show that. And you maybe find people would say, well, you know, that's traditional, that's old, we don't do that. But you're still doing the same kind of work, even if you've got this new mystical terminology that we're using. So if a Gantt chart's a useful way to show how these pieces fit together to make sure that we have the right outcome when we're done, why not? Thanks. I'm going to start winding up uh, the show now. It's gone far too quick. Um, So apologies for that. There's one question I'm going to sneak in, though. It's actually one of my emergency questions in case we got finished too early, but can you provide some tips for somebody that's got an ongoing project that loves what we've spoken about? It totally fits their brain. They want to start adopting things. Where could they start? We can probably both comment on that. I have some suggestions. I would say first, if things aren't going as well as you like, and you think that, oh, maybe we should do some of this stuff, Let's do some root cause analysis to understand why. I'm a big fan of root cause analysis so we understand a problem before we start applying a solution, such as, you know, maybe you say, oh, we we should do use cases. Okay, well, why are you not already getting the results that you want? You know, if if use cases are the answer, what's the question? Might be a perfect solution, might not solve your problem. Retrospectives are a good way to start that activity. In the you're going through a an iterative project, you know, a retrospective is a typical part of many agile projects, and those should be taken very seriously, using the knowledge from that, the insights to understand what didn't go as well as we'd like, what did great, and let's translate that into better action on the next iteration. So if you can trace any of the problems or issues you encountered back to requirements-related factors, then you can consider which of the 20 practices we talk about or the dozens and dozens of practices in other books on requirements engineering and business analysis. Pick out which of those you think might help you solve that problem. But you can actually start doing this stuff incrementally. If you don't have a complete set of models, fine. Draw a model for the next piece of the work you have to do just to both get comfortable with the technique and to begin enhancing your skills. Yeah, you could create a baseline, couldn't you, any, at any point and then work from there. And that was exactly you know I wanted to add on that is assess where you are now. You may be doing a lot of the pieces of the practices that we talk about, but you may be calling them something else. So understand where you are and then as Carl mentioned, you don't have to do everything at once. And sometimes it can seem overwhelming to have you know, 20 practices. That's a lot of things to do. But you don't have to bite off everything at once. You can you know, pick one practice or one model just to incrementally improve over time. Thanks. So I think it's a good time now to ask my usual question um, at the end of the show. If there was one thing, I'll start with you, Carl, first. If there's one thing you'd like a software engineer to remember from this show, what would you like it to be? Well, my bottom line point is that all project and product teams have to deal with requirements for the work they do, whatever they call them. And I think if anyone from a a software team were to look at the 20 practices that Candace and I recommend in this book, they would realize that virtually all of them apply to their work. So I suggest that listeners and readers select those practices, starting with, you know, maybe just a couple, as Candace suggested, you don't have to do them all right away, select the practices that they think would be most valuable for increasing the chance of success, for reducing risk, or even better, reducing current points of pain. And then think about how best to adapt the practices to suit the nature and culture of your project team and organization. So I think of the the practices that I write about in requirements books that I've done as a toolkit. And you can assemble a a package of tools and techniques that are going to be appropriate for your project, your situation, your problems 
and adapt them. Don't necessarily figure they're going to plug in exactly without a little thought and considering your your culture and and uh, you know the, the nature of the organization. But I think if you go through the list, you'll find that they pretty much all apply. And Candace? Well, I think Carl stole mine, but I have another one up on my sleeve. Mm -hmm. Um, It goes back to some of the themes of the book that we talked about early on, which is, you know, we don't do software requirements all at once. It is that iterative and circular process that we are going to go through multiple times throughout a product or project's life cycle. So understanding that you're not going to, you know, do the analysis once and you're done. And also that change happens. So those two together means that we're, we should always be constantly learning more about the product or project that we're working on and be willing to embrace that change and move forward with that project. Thank you. Was, was there anything we missed we'd have liked to mention? Well, we could both talk about this stuff for hours and hours, but we only have one hour here, so I think we've done a pretty thorough job. <laughs> Thank you. So people can follow you both on LinkedIn. I'll put the links in the show notes. Is there any other way you'd like them to get in touch if they need, need to? Well, through LinkedIn or through our, our uh, websites, I think you're going to show some of our websites there as well. So That's uh, right, yeah. the, the website for the book is probably the most valuable place to get started. It's just softwarerex.com, softwarereqs.com is a, a good entry point into all of this. For example, we have a, a video series called the One Minute Analyst, which has got a just a very, very concise highlights of each of these 20 practices. So that's a good starting point as well. But uh, we're pretty easy to find online. So Carl and Candice, thank you for coming on the show. It's been a real pleasure. This is Gavin Henry for Software Engineering Radio. Thank you for listening. Thanks for listening to SE Radio, an educational program brought to you by IEEE Software Magazine. For more about the podcast, including other episodes, visit our website at se-radio.net. To provide feedback, you can comment on each episode on the website or reach us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, or through our Slack channel at seradio.slack.com. You can also email us at team at se-radio.net. This and all other episodes of SE Radio is licensed under Creative Commons License 2.5. Thanks for listening.